All right, welcome to Tax Tuesday. Hopefully you guys can hear us and all is good out there in tax land. My name is Toby Mathis. And I'm Jeff Webb. And we are bringing tax knowledge to the masses today. And uh, today is an interesting one. I looked at the questions just a little bit ago and uh, it seems like people have short-term rentals on the brain. Yep. So uh, I think I counted four or five questions that pertain to short-term rentals. So if you're somebody who's into Airbnb or VRBO or what are the other ones? Are there any others? That's only two I'm aware of. Uh, then this is going to be a fun day for you. If you're not, uh, well, you, well, there's other questions. All right. No, I just noticed there was definitely a little bit of a bend towards that. Mm -hmm. All right. And this says VP of professional services. You are now the CFO of that is correct. Yeah. So I have to update our slides to appropriately put cfo big cfo which is great maybe, um, maybe i'll put a cfo picture up you should put a C I don't even know what a cfo ufo i've heard of cfo it just is rare all right uh where are you guys all coming from if you're sitting someplace to say what city and state it's always fun to see how many people are all over the place twin falls idaho look at that Allison is fast. Golden, Colorado. Oh, now they're just flying through. Oh my God. This is horrible. I cannot read these fast enough. Portland, Los Angeles, West Orange, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, New Jersey, Simi Valley, Mesa, Santa Cruz, Philadelphia, PA, my hometown. Um, let me see if I go back. I, say, I think they can hear us. They can hear us. Yeah, there's Seattle, Houston, McKinney, Texas. See, now I just totally am cheating. Tampa. Uh, Elise Oviedo, uh, Portland, Oregon. Got people from New York. Hey, from New York, Los Angeles, Boone, Iowa. I don't think I've ever seen Boone, Iowa. That makes so. Robin, welcome. Uh, Louisiana. Where in Louisiana, Ross? Big, big, big state that we got. Some Kansas City, some West Orange, some Chicago in the house. Austin, Texas, Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro, that's cool. Mark, welcome. So we got people from all over the place. There's Kansas City, Mo, Missouri. Uh, and we got BC, Canada in the house. I got a good friend lawyer up there in, uh, in British Columbia and Vancouver. Had some friend, actually I had a consul with somebody that was sitting in Vancouver today, said it was absolutely beautiful. Green Valley, Arizona, some Las Vegas. That's where we're sitting. Seattle, Washington, St. George, Huntington Beach, California, surf capital of the world, and uh, all over the place. There's a Honolulu. So we have folks just really all. Oh, there's Lancaster, California. I thought it was PA for a second. I was all getting excited and giddy. But we got people from across the country and even across some of the globe. Welcome. These are, these are fun little tidbits. We should be here for about an hour. We already have a ton of people on. We have people on Facebook Live. Welcome and hey, and uh, I'll give you the chaka. Welcome to uh, another fun-filled Tuesday where we just try to answer questions. We're going to go through the questions that we're going to answer here in a second. Wait a second. Hawaii is the surfing capital of the world. Now we're going to have a fight. I thought Huntington Beach was, and I've seen Dukes there. So I know that, I, I don't know. Although I'd probably side with Hawaii, but that's just me. Water is warmer. Um, all right. Email your questions in during the week. Tax Tuesday at Anderson Advisors. We pick questions. <laughs> now we have, yes, now we have a fight going on. But you guys, I don't think you guys can see each other. But Huntington Beach, apparently, you guys are, it's, it's going to be all caps here in a second. And we got Dukes. If you guys have questions during the week, send them in. We pick them and then I read them. <laughs> And Jeff and I answer them. So that's how it works. Uh, Hawaii has the patent on surfing. Boy, I uh, opened up a can of worms on that one. Um, we'll say they're both uh, joint. Because remember, you got Dukes in both places. Come on. Uh, U.S. Open in Hersey. Yep, there we go. Huntington Beach is probably rocking right now. All right, so we have a lot to go over. that does not involve surfing unless, that, unless we're talking about the kind that you do on the internet. All right, opening questions. I picked some long ones and I apologize. They're not always the most fun to read, but this is, I get, I just get a whole bunch and I just grab 10 
15, 20, whatever I feel like on that particular day today, we're in the teens. So we'll go through these, but they're, they're good and educational. So this is why I like them. We are converting our vacation home into a short-term rental in 2023. Too many personal days used in 2022. I'll explain what that means. Jeff and I will explain. We want to make some updates. So we are wondering on the timing, should we convert to a short-term rental in early 23, make it available for X days, then block out the calendar, then remodel an update, or should we just do the remodel now in 2022 before converting? And then the basis when converted to the LLC will already be increased. Somebody has been doing their homework. You're very, very intelligent. You get a big star for even knowing these questions to, to ask. I want to have a cost seg done and would like those updates included in the cost seg if I could. Really good questions. This is why I love this one. Like when I looked at it, it was just like really long and it had a bunch of XXX in it. And I was like, oh my God, what are they asking? And then I realized it's just the number of days. But I grabbed that one and I said, that's going to be a good one. All right. We have to clean the STR this, this first year or do we... Do we, ha we have to clean the short-term rental is what STR means this first year to get the hours necessary for active participation. Um, is it a, it, it is a 90 to 120 month drive one way. That must be minute drive one way. Since we will be working, can we stay in the unit that night without counting as personal use? So I'll be an interesting one. If you're retired and receive social security and annuity income, can you get your closing costs deducted from your income tax when you file? Um, I fixed that little typo. I just grab them, guys. Um, we'll answer that one. I'm setting up a corporation to wholesale and flip and later on hold real estate. Please don't. <laughs> just say that. Don't, don't, don't hold in the corporation, please. Uh, I have high startup costs, 20000 and this is my first business entity that I've ever started. I am a full-time ICU nurse and pay lots of taxes. Thank you for your service. And I know that's a tough one. Is there any way I can roll over losses from the corporation to my W taxes from my nursing job? Really good question. And Jeff will probably be answering that one. I have a beach house that I'm starting to rent out. So I got a DBA business name. I've been renovating and fixing it up to make it more attractive. I have a regular job and was told that if I made more than $150,000, I would not be able to write off my expenses and costs associated with my rental. Is this true? <laughs> like, you see what I'm saying? These are good questions that uh, could be very educational for everybody. And it's good for Jeff and I to discuss too, because believe it or not, there's gray areas here. I have a C Corp in Nevada through which I send some quarterly consulting and management revenue from my other manufacturing business. I don't take a salary or dividends, but I use the earnings for equipment financing. On my taxes, I categorize most of the accumulated earnings as, appro as appropriated earnings to avoid the accumulated earnings tax. But the retained earnings numbers grows every year in the with the income taxes paid. How do I categorize earnings used for taxes to lower the chance of accumulated earnings tax? Really good question. And I bet you guys have never heard of this thing before and we will have some fun with this one. This is where Jeff gets excited. Can't really tell it, but he's, Definitely excited right now. Accumulated earnings tax. See? <laughs> some, some things. Some people you say football. It's football season. And they're like, yes, I get excited if I say accumulated earnings tax. Just like, yes, it's been so long. All right. As an investor owner, is it possible to claim part of my internet phone and home office as expenses? We'll talk about that. Uh, can you explain short-term rental tax benefit and how to get 100 hours of material participation? We'll go through that too. If I offset all of the passive income with depreciation or accelerated depreciation, would that eliminate the AMT adjustment? Note W-2 income is less than $57,000 a year and very little interest from bank accounts and dividends less than a hundred, or still, excuse me, less than a thousand dollars per year for both. Good question, AMT, another one. Mr. here, right, the CPA guy next to me is probably like stoked today. Like there, that's our new word for the day is stoked because of Huntington Beach. Uh, let's see, I have a four unit. I want to live in and rent out the other three units. House hacking. What are all the tax deductions and write-offs I can use to zero out earnings? So we'll be here till midnight going through all the different tax deductions. No, we'll go, we'll go through these two. All right, last couple of questions. Um, any details on the short-term rental loophole? Hmm, in terms of how long 
to keep the rental in service for if you can do it for one year and then benefit from classification and then decide to use the property only for your personal use after that one year? If so, how much time does it need to stay in service or how many rental days do you need to have a year? We'll, so we'll go through that. We'll break that one down. That's a little bit of a word salad. We will break that down into bite-sized pieces. I bought a $400,000 home in 2021 and it is now ready to use for short-term rental. To use the short-term rental loophole to offset some of my W-2 active income. I want to use cost segregation, study and claim bonus depreciation. Any thoughts on using a DIY do-it-yourself for the cost seg on a property of this value? Yes, and we will share them with you. You ready, Jeff? We're I've fun. seen short-term rental loophole a couple times now. I wonder whether they've been watching our channel because if you have W-2 income, this is one of the few ways where you can get some relief because it's not a rental property. It's a trader business. Oh, it's a trader business. People don't realize that necessarily. Hey, if you like this type of information, you want to learn as much as you can. You want to fill your brain full of tax strategies because by the way, the Internal Revenue Code tells us what we should be investing in. They'll usually say, hey, we're going to beat you up if you do this, and we're going to reward you if you do this over here. That way you can go, let's go over here. So by all means, go to our YouTube, sign up, subscribe. doesn't cost you anything, and you don't get spammed. It's literally just YouTube. And if you like a video, you please like it. Click the little like button, whatever it is. It might say like, it might smile or something but it lets Google know that you're actually watching it or YouTube know, which is Google and helps with our algorithms. So we have better reach so we can share our word. We're getting the word out. Taxes are not just for boring people, but for exciting people like Jeff and me, we are really exciting. All right. We are converting our vacation home into a short-term rental in 2023, too many personal days used in 2021 or 2022. By the way, what's a short-term rental? Uh, short-term rental is generally uh, a home that you run out to for an average of seven or less days uh, and provide uh, substantial services to your short-term tenants. Yeah, you don't even have to provide substantial services. It's seven days or less, right? Mm -hmm. It's basically, if you have 10 rentals, and those 10 rentals use your house 300 days. Your average term is 30 days per rental. If you flip that around and you have 100 tenants during the year and rented for 300 days, your average stay is three days, which is seven days or less, which means it's not rental activity, it's a trader business. You're running a hotel you're running a hotel and it's non-residential too. They say it's transient nature. So it is not even residential property. We're not writing off our home under 27 and a half years. We are writing off our home. What is it? 39, 39, 39 years. Yep. So here's the deal. They want to take a vacation home. So we'll just call it a second home. And they used it too many personal days in 2022. Why is that important, Jeff? Well, there's a rule that says if uh, you use it more than 10% of the days you rented it out, if you use it personally for more than 10% of the days, or the second rule is more than 15 days, uh, 15 days or more that uh, it doesn't count as a rental counts as a vacation home. Yeah, you, you go above, it's the greater of 14 days or 10% of the total days rented and it's treated as a residence, which means you can't take losses on it. I mean, that's the bad part. And you would bifurcate out the portion that was used for business and the portion that was used for investing. By the way, I neglected to say something earlier. We have Matthew, Patty, Christos, Dana, Dutch, Elliot, Ian, Pio, and Troy, all answering questions in the Q&A. If you have questions, do not put them into chat. Put them into Q&A and you'll have a tax attorney, CPA, or accountant answering your question absolutely free. All right. So, Sorry. No. Sorry. And what happens with a vacation home is your expenses, uh, deductible expenses are limited to your income from that activity. Yep. 
So if I have rental income of ten thousand dollars but expenses of one hundred thousand uh, dollars, my deduction no loss, no loss, no loss against your W two. We don't get to play the game of hey, I have other passive income from other act rental mm -hmm. activities. I can't use it. I'm toast. So what there's so it sounds to me that they used it for too many days, more than they rented it. It's a residence. It's not a. Um, it's it's not investment property. So they're going to change that. So now this is what's really, really important. We want to make some updates. So they're wondering about the timing. When I, when I hear updates, they want to fix the place up. Should we convert to a short-term rental in early 2023, make it available for XXX days, then block out the calendar and then remodel or update? Or should we just do the remodel now? What do you think, Jeff? Uh, I, I think I would go ahead and start it out as that short-term rental, get, get a couple of rentals under my belt, then take it out of service for however long it takes to do those updates and remodels, uh, and then get that done. Yeah. So the reason this is important, and Jeff's absolutely 100% right, and I agree, I would put it into service, I would make my improvements, and then I would take it back out of service. I mean, excuse me, I would take it out of service to do the improvements and then put it back in. And the reason mm -hmm. that this is important is because when you look at a property, let's say that uh, this is specifically for short term. This yeah. might not be the case on a uh, long term rental. And the reason is this that when I look at a property, I have structural components that are called. 1250 property and I have personal property, things that can be removed that are 1245 and things that are 1245 have a much shorter useful life. Like your carpet can be removed. It has a useful life of five years. So we write it off much faster. And under our current setup, bonus depreciation is available on anything that's below 20 years. So you could write off your carpeting in, year, in one year, whether it's Airbnb or otherwise, but your structural, like your roof is still written off over, in this case, 39 years, because it's considered non-residential property, believe it or not, even though it's, it's, it's treated like a hotel. Um, the reason this is important is because when you have non-residential property and you make improvements to it, you can write off that improvement under a shorter lifespan. What is it, 15 year property? Yes. Or any of it, I could write off in year one, right? Uh, but that expires at the end of this year. So you could do that in 2022. Oh, not in 2023. So it won't work in 2023. So, so they might- Unless they extend it again. Which, what are the chances, right? Mm -hmm. Did they extend it? Cause it was for 18, 19, 20. And then they extended, extended it to 21 it. and 22. So we'd have to also look at the Inflation Reduction Act, see if there's anything in there, because they have been extending a lot of these. But let's just go back to this. If it's qualified improvement property, it is deductible immediately. So if you have a non-residential property and you make improvements, you get to write it off, even if it is something that would be considered 1250 property. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the only property you can accelerate depreciation on is 1245 property, which is like cabinets, your fence, driveway, your carpeting, your, your linoleum, your cat, you know, things that you put into the property. If you put it into service, short-term rental, seven days or less, then do the updates, that would be considered, uh, or should be considered, I should say, because like Jeff's pointing out, it might not be the case next year, yeah. qualified improvement property, although they keep extending it. Um, if you just did the improvement now and then put it into service, you're not completely out of luck. It just means that the only property that gives you the massive deduction is that 1245 property, which is the five-year property, the seven-year property, and the 15-year property. That's, that's our little little wackadoodle thing. Yeah, that the qualified uh, improvement property that you're talking about has to be in service at the time that you make those improvements. Mm -hmm. You have, Jeff, what Jeff is saying is 
we have to have the property in service as a non-residential trader business before the improvements are put in there yeah. in order for those to be deducted, right? So, sometimes you make me sound really smart. You're smart. All right, so that just says, hey, I have two choices here, which is gonna yield me the greatest amount of deduction, put it into service, do the improvements. Uh, it's almost always gonna be better. It's almost always gonna be easier too from a cost seg standpoint, as opposed to coming in after the fact and doing it. And the reason being is because you have all the receipts, you just did the big improvement and you could you could show the cost seg engineer Here's what I what I spent it on. Instead of looking at it and, and basing it on a kind of percentage base, you could actually look. You could literally take this is what they spent on it, because here's a receipt. Makes it a little bit easier. So, that's your answer. You can absolutely do a cost seg. You can absolutely do the improvements in and under either one of those. If you do the qualified improvement. And we have the extension into 2023. Like if you did it this year, I could tell you definitively, the answer is you would just write off the qualified improvement. If it's next year, you should be able to, we'll see if they extend it. I, I just don't know sitting here. Um, but no matter what, you'll be able to write off uh, the 1245 property if you go through the process of getting a, a cost seg done. And a cost seg is nothing more than saying, here's the value of the carpet, here's the value of the driveway, here's the value of the shrubs and the fence and the cabinets that you put in. And here's the value of uh, some specialty plumbing and electric, the removable electric, you know, electric stuff. All that, they compartmentalize. It's usually about 30% of the improvement value of a property. And if you do that, you can write that off 100% in next year. You could absolutely do that because because the bonus depreciation when does it stop being 100 in two this years? Year. This year? So next year. Would so be... 2023, it drops 80%. Uh, that makes me want to think about this a little bit. But the other thing I was wondering was, would this be a candidate for a master lease? Mm, it depends on whether they're a real estate professional. I know what you're saying. Uh, I'm thinking that it might be a way to turn it into a short-term rental in 2022. But if they have too many personal days in 2022, then. But they don't own. Well, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to still. Okay. It's still a residence. It just means that we won't be able to use the loss in 2022. What if we put it into service, did our improvement, and then did a cost seg and made it effective in 2023? You would still have your cost seg, but you'd have the 80% amount of the. Um, it, it does is all that means is that if I had a hundred thousand dollars of improvements that were 1245 property, I get eighty thousand dollars of deduction next year, as opposed to this year would be um hundred. Yeah. No, that's a good point. If if you place it in service in 2022 and do the cost seg before the end of the year, actually you can do it after the end of the year for 2022. Yeah, you could actually do it next year. Uh you're gonna get a little more bang for your buck. Which um, by the way, you could actually be making this election uh to use a cost seg for 2021, even right now, even though you're sitting here in the, the second half of 2022, mm -hmm. you could be making that election to, to in, in accelerating depreciation if you wanted to for your properties that you held last year and lowering your 2021 taxes. So there's, there's still, there's always a way to, uh, to take advantage of the incentives that are put out there in the code. Sometimes you don't realize you can go back. Like you can even be making contributions to employer retirement plans, so long as you haven't filed the return yet. Yep. So if you have an S corp and you have a solo 401k, you could still be making contributions, employer contributions for last year that are deductible in 2021. Uh, and somebody says, do you have to pay for all your upgrades or just sign a contract? I believe you have to put them into service. Um, yeah, it, it's not even a matter of paying for it. It's whether or not they're being used in the business. Yeah, so you have to, it, it actually has to be put into service. Otherwise it wouldn't work. Yeah, so I know what you guys are saying. In some cases, what is the one where they're saying that a a, a lease to, or excuse me, a, a contract, a firm contract to purchase is in solar. Mm -hmm. You're seeing some people saying, hey, if you want the 30% uh, the credit, as long as you have a contract to purchase the solar and install it, 
that's a uh, that's a hard contract that could be enforced against you that you could take the the tax credit this year. That's the only time I see something where you could contract for it and actually get it. Uh, I'm from the government. We never pay pay down. Oh, John. All right, we have it. We have to clean the short-term rental this first year to get the hours necessary for active participation. There's no actual hours for active participation, but well, I think you mean material, material participation, participation. But whatever. I mean, I I get your point. It is a ninety to twenty drive. I don't know if that's minute or a, or a mile drive one way. Since we'll be working, can we stay in the unit that night without counting it as personal use? Kind of some mixed questions. I think you can include the travel time. Mm -hmm. uh, however, staying the night will not count towards working on it. Uh, you actually have to be physically no, working No, I think on they're it. saying, does it count as personal use? It definitely counts as personal use. So if you are staying in a house for the, uh, I think they're looking at the 14 day and the uh, or the 10% of rented mm -hmm. days, then they're worried that they're going to push themselves above the threshold and make it into a property that has to bifurcate the investment use versus the personal use. Um, you can always, and this is going to be the IRS positions as there's a motel six right down the street from your house. I know where so, it's at. So you would tell them not to stay in the property. I would say if it's only one night, it's, probably not really going to affect anything unless you already used it a bunch. Here's a, another way to look at it is how many days are you actually renting it this year? If it's like 30 days or worse, let's say it's 20 days, make sure that you're not doing more than 10% of those Yeah, because it could bite you. And I understand that you want to stay at the unit of the night. I believe that the rules are that you can do it when you're doing rehabs and remodels and construction that you could stay in and it doesn't count. But when you're not doing that, I, I don't think it, I think it counts as a personal day. Otherwise people would just say, hey, I stayed there, but I was cleaning the unit for three days, right? Um, I understand why they're doing this. It's mm -hmm. because they want the material participation and it's, you don't have to worry about hours. Again, if, no, if nobody else is cleaning your unit, nobody else is providing substantial services you don't have to worry about the 100 hour test. It's only if somebody else is providing, if somebody else was cleaning it, then we're worried about you hitting your 100 hours and you would have to do more hours than anybody else. So if, if you have somebody cleaning your unit, that's not what, that's not the death knell. Make sure that it's, you're rotating that person. So nobody's doing more than 100 hours. Nobody's doing more time than you. And then make sure that you're documenting the time that you actually do things for the short-term rental, including mm -hmm. handling your bookings, drive it there, doing any 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 fix up, you know, putting things around, whatever you're working on on the property, uh, just know that you got to keep good records because the IRS looks at it, and the the tax courts have looked at these with a raised eyebrow when somebody drives a long ways and they go, "You didn't do eight hours, like you were there, and you probably did two. If you ask for some ridiculous amount, they might look at you and say, "No." Uh, probably the biggest killer for material participation is a third party property manager for short term rentals, especially if it's out of state, your yep. property's out of state. So make sure you're doing the rentals. That's the big one. So uh, let me just go back and answer this. Active participation, by the way, is if you're doing rental, not short terms. The short term rentals, seven days or less, is a trader business. If you're doing rental activity, active participation just means you're managing the manager. You get a $25,000 deduction or up to a $25,000 deduction. That is not the issue here. The issue here is material participation. So just to put a little correction there. All right. If you are retired and receive Social Security and annuity income, can you get your closing costs deductible from your income tax when you file? Reading this, I'm guessing they're talking about closing costs on the purchase or sale of a house. Um, if it's on the sale of a house, it actually reduces your, your capital gains amount. Uh, if you buy a house and have closing costs, uh, it's going to go into the basis of your property. So if I buy a house for $100,000, have $10,000 uh, mm -hmm. for closing costs, I'm going to have a basis of $110,000. Yeah, I, I would say that, and there's one exception to that rule, which is if you're paying down points yeah. 
if you're paying down the cost of your loan, then you would write it off as what? Uh, it actually more, writes off as, as mortgage. mortgage interest. Yeah, yeah, that's mortgage. So prepaid mortgage is basically it. Right. Some people call that a closing cost, but yeah. right, origination fees or all your traditional closing right. costs you're adding into your basis or you're writing off when you sell as a, is again, you're writing it off as basis, right? So it's, it's increasing your basis in both cases. One of them you're not using to, to deduct to get anything against anything. When you're selling, you're using it to deduct, deduct against the sales price. So you're getting a deduction that way. But it doesn't matter whether you're retired or receiving social security. They do not care. That rule is just hard and fast. You don't get to write off closing costs mm -hmm. with the one exception of closing costs that are actually interest deductions, right. right? All right, I'm setting up a corporation to wholesale and flip and later on hold real estate. I have, so they're gonna wholesale and flip property and then they're gonna hold real estate. Don't hold real estate in a corporation, period. The only exception is if you're selling a property that was your personal residence to a wholly owned S corporation for purposes of stepping up basis and accelerating depreciation and taking advantage of the 121 exclusion, which is the 250 or $500,000 exclusion. If you, if you wanna, you're moving out of a house and you wanna make it into a rental and, you want, and you've owned it for a while and you wanna step up the basis because this property value has gone through the roof. You don't have to pay tax on the gain. You could do that even on an installment sale. We would elect out of the installment sale treatment and just take the exclusion, which means no tax on the sale of your house. That's the only time I want to see a house in a corporation. Can you think of anything else? No, not really. Yeah. If you're going to hold real estate, do not do it in a corporation. If you're going to flip real estate, then I don't care. Do it in a corporation. I have high startup costs, $20,000 in, uh, in this. And this is my first business entity I've ever started. I'm a full-time ICU, ICU nurse and pay lots of taxes. Is there any way I can roll over losses from the corporation to my W-2 taxes from my nursing job? So there are no way to roll over losses from your corporation to your personal return because it's the corporation's losses. Mm -hmm. uh, and the W-2 is your, they're your two what if, separate entities. What if it's a S corporation? S corporation, definitely. Um, then you could carry, then then you could write off the loss if you put the money in it. The loss, actually the loss, any losses would roll over to you personally. Yes. So you could write off your ICU nurse W-2 if you, if the S corporation essentially paid you back, it has to incur the expense, right? right. So if you paid for stuff and you put it in there and you said, hey, it's going to reimburse you at some point, it's a cash basis taxpayer, meaning that it gets to take the loss when it pays you back. So you're going to have to loan it some money to pay you back. Mm -hmm. Sounds goofy. But then the S Corp would have a $20,000 loss and you could write it off on your personal taxes under those circumstances if you materially participated in the business. Now, something I was thinking about, because you said, please don't put your long-term rentals in your corporation. Uh, if you're going to do long-term rentals, I would either rent them in my name or a partnership name and then have this very same corporation managing these rental properties. Yeah. And, you know, somebody says, if, if, if what should I hold real estate in if not a corporation? You're always going to do an LLC. Uh, if you're in California, it might be a Wyoming statutory trust. If it's in Florida, it might be a land trust. They have a statute that's just like LLCs. It's going to be in a pass-through entity that we can ignore for tax purposes, or that can be held in a partnership, an mm -hmm. LLC tax as a partnership. And the reason that we do that is to qualify for loans because there's a difference on where it gets reported for purposes of Freddie and Fannie loans. It's 75% of value on page one of Schedule E, it's 100% of values on Schedule two of Schedule E, on page two of Schedule E mm -hmm. on your 1040. A K-1 that comes from a partnership goes on page two. A K-1 that comes from an S-corp goes on page two. A disregarded entity that has real estate goes on page one of your Schedule E, which is really, really uh, problematic if you're trying to qualify for loans because you want all the income to be, uh, to be carried. So what would you hold it in? What Jeff just said is absolutely 100% correct. If you're going to have buy and hold real estate, it's going to be 
either an LLC or trust holding that real estate. And more than likely that LLC or trust is gonna be directed and owned by a singular LLC, most likely in Wyoming, because nobody can take it away from you. That is taxed as a partnership. If it's your only one, it might be an LLC in your home state, unless that home state is California or is Florida, which case we might do it slightly different. Then what Jeff said is even easier because you could have the corporation manage that entity and pull additional revenue out of it that goes from being something that would ordinarily flow on your return as rental income. Mm -hmm. And now, excuse me, is going to the corporation as income and it is using probably to reimburse you expenses that you're incurring on its behalf or to pay expenses directly. Uh, and if, you're, if this is confusing to you guys, I would really encourage you to go to the YouTube channel and start watching the real estate videos, both myself and Clint. We go over this over and over and over again. And then we also teach a class called the Tax and Asset Protection Workshop every other Saturday. I'm, I'll probably show you a link. Actually, I don't think I put it in there today, but maybe Patty will share a link out there in, in chat land. And you can go to the tax and asset protection event and we will teach you where you hold your real estate. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, you just come on, except a little bit of time. You gotta go spend a, a day with us. So you're gonna wanna do that. So maybe Patty can share that link. You're having people ask you. So I'll just go Patty, Patty, Patty. Just teasing. Somebody maybe will share that link. They'll get it out there. <laughs> I lost. So we'll figure out where it is. We'll send it out to you guys. Um, all right. I have a beach house that I'm starting to rent out. So I got a DBA business name. I have been renovating and fixing it up to make it more attractive. I have a regular job and was told that if I made more than $150,000, I would not be able to write off my expenses and costs associated with my rental. Is this true? This is a first of a couple questions that the answer is it depends. Uh, but I want to address the DBA first. The DBA is in California, it's called a fictitious name. Mm -hmm. It offers you no kind of protection at all. How do you know zero. it's in California? Well, there's a beach involved. What if it's Florida? Okay. What if it's North Carolina? What if it's South Carolina? What if it's uh, the, Virginia? The, the DBA it's, doesn't. What if it's oh, New Jersey? Oh my gosh, Dobie. Uh, the DBA doesn't offer you what any kind Florida? of liability protection. I'm just going to talk louder. <laughs> and uh, nor does it uh, uh, give you any anonymity uh, because at least in the case of California, they're usually ran by the local counties and all. Yeah, DBA. It, it lists who is actually the owner of that DBA. A DBA does not give you any benefit whatsoever other than you get to possibly have another name on your check. I would actually put it in a, again, a trust or an LLC. If it is California, Wyoming statutory trust to avoid the $800. There are beaches in Michigan. There's beaches in Ohio. There's beaches all over the place. There's a lot of beaches. Life's a beach. And uh, like we were talking about earlier, there's Huntington Beach and there's Hawaii that has beaches. There's a lot of beaches. We're not at a loss of beaches. So, but you immediately uh, yeah. went to California. Uh, yeah, I know. All right. So the $150,000 rule, though, mm -hmm. they're obviously thinking of the act. If somebody said, oh, you could only write off the expenses if you're over, you know, if it's under $150,000, they are talking about losses being deductible as an, as an active participant in rental real estate. So you have this beach house. So the first thing we got to figure out is, is it a residence that's being used as a investment or is it just an investment if it is just an investment is it short term or is it or is it long term once we know those things then we can give you a really good a clear idea because if it's short term rental it's not rental we don't worry about active participation we don't worry about real estate professional or any of those things it's the only question is it's an ordinary loss is it non passive um and you get to write off all your expenses and depreciate the, the house. So if it's a rental and it's longer than an average stay of seven days, longer than a day, uh, or longer than, what is it? Uh, eight to 30 days with significant services provided mm -hmm. or substantial services provided, and then greater than 30 days with extraordinary services provided, 
those are the rules as to when it's not a rental. If it's a rental and you really are just doing this like a month to month or an annual lease, which is probably the more, more likely event, then the question is, can I write off my expenses? Yes. But if it creates a loss with the, your expenses and depreciation, now there's an exception. And the exception is to the general rule, the general rule being, I can't use my passive losses against my active income. Mm -hmm. I can write off up to $25,000 of passive losses if I actively participate in real estate. That just means I pick the manager. I don't even have to manage the property, but it phases out between 100,000 and $150,000. For every $2, it goes up above 100,000, your income, you lose $1 of deduction. So at 150,000, you lose that $25,000 completely. So if you're making $100,000 a year, you can write off up to $25,000 of passive losses from rental real estate and use them against your income. So all of a sudden, let's say you're making 100,000 and you have $25,000 of loss, you're now making 75,000. Add on top of that, your standard deduction, you're barely paying taxes at all. You're going to be really, really happy. That's going to have a pretty major impact on your overall tax bill. You get up to 150000 that goes away, but you still have real estate professional. You still have the short-term rental. You still have some other things that, in your back pocket. Plus, you can always write off the expenses and costs against that income. So if you have rental income, you can always use it. The only question is, can I write off the loss? If it mm -hmm. creates a loss, you do not lose your loss. If you could use it against other uh, passive income. So if you have other rentals, if you have another business interest that you don't materially participate in, you get to use it against it. You can even use it. This is twisted, but you could actually use it against short-term rental that you do not materially participate in because you have somebody else do it and you're passive. Then you could even use it to offset that. So like, or if I, if I was in a pizza shop with Jeff, that's my favorite example. Jeff and I open a pizza shop. He works it. I don't do anything. I'm a silent partner. I could use any losses from my beach house to offset any income that the pizza parlor gives me because they're both considered passive. Very exciting stuff, Jeff. I don't know if anybody understood anything I just said. All right. I have a C corporation in Nevada through which I send some quarterly consulting and management revenue from my other manufacturing businesses. So it sounds like you have a management company that is contracted with other businesses and it's getting paid. Uh, on my taxes, I categorize most of the accumulated earnings as appropriated earnings to avoid the accumulated earnings tax. But the retained earnings number grows every year with the income taxes paid. How do I categorize earnings used for taxes to lower the chance of an accumulated earnings tax? Um, I almost never see appropriated earnings used on the balance sheet for tax returns. What is an appropriated earning? Appropriated earnings are earnings that you have set aside for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you're going to open up another franchise or build a building or something like that. Those would be appropriated earnings. So basically, you're saying, you're saying the money's already spent what's an accumulated earnings and what's this tax and why do we have to be aware of it? So accumulated earnings tax is a tax on corporations for basically not paying your money out to your investors, either in form of dividends or salaries or something. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, you have a bunch of cash and the only reason you're leaving it in there is because you didn't want to pay tax on it. So as long as you have another reason for that cash to be going in there. Hey, I'm, I need it for other projects. I'm gonna, I'm gonna acquire more assets. I'm gonna, I'm loaning it. Uh, there's, I need to replace or have revenue opportunities, but I need to have enough cash stockpiled to do so. As long as you have some plausible reason, yes, you don't pay tax on it. I don't think I've ever seen an accumulated earnings tax imposed on one of our clients. I have not seen it on any small clients I've ever worked with. Yeah, it, it's when big companies have no reason to stockpile cash. They're not expanding. They have no other reason than yeah. they're just sitting on it. And they're not giving it out to their shareholders where the IRS would be able to charge a dividend tax, which is long-term capital gains, or paid out in revenue, in which case the IRS would get revenue. They just want something to happen with the cash. 
if you're just accumulating it, just make sure you have a reason to accumulate it that's not tax motivated. Um, so a couple things about this tax is they don't hit the first two. If you have less than two hundred fifty thousand dollars accumulated, they're not. It's not looked at. It's an automatic exemption. Um, but if you do have more than that. Sit down and write up a plan, put it in your file cabinet. Uh, I would also put it in the company minutes what my plan is, why mm-hmm. I'm holding this cash back. And uh, as long as you're documenting it and you say, here's what I'm doing, uh, you're going to be fine. And you got to have a lot of cash before they even look at you. Again, I've not seen a small company ever get hit with this. It's what, 20%? The accumulated earnings tax. Yep, twenty percent. Yeah, so they just say, "Hey, you're not using your money. Let's let's hit it. Just make sure you're doing something with it. And you have a reason. Invest it in something. Loan it. Put it out on the street. Do hard money loans. Loan it to yourself. I don't care. Just do something. Jeff's probably going to have a aneurysm if I say no. loan it to yourself. But you just make sure you're documenting that you have a reason to be uh, stockpiling cash. And loaning to yourself, so real, it's actually a really good idea better than or pay it out to yourself it's it's long-term capital gains it's going to be zero 15 or 20 percent it's not that bad of a hit but i, I wanted to go back to something she, they said earlier is that it keeps getting bigger and bigger what would you say about actually managing the money that's coming in maybe they're putting too much into the corporation well obviously you're going to have a better tax bracket so maybe you're in the highest bracket and you're mm-hmm. like hey it's 21 21 percent Loan it back out and use it in your other entities that are that are doing uh, investments. Yeah, that's take out yeah. take out your mortgage, take out any loans you have on any real estate, buy more real estate, use the money as a as as, as a loan, pay the corporation a small interest. That way, you never have to worry about it. And also take a hard look at reimbursable expenses that you could be deducting in the corporation to help lower some of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, these earnings. Hey, uh, question that somebody asked that was in the chat, and I'm just, I know Patty makes everybody go to the question and answer, but they asked a question about UBIT for short term rentals in a 401k. Have you seen a UBIT issue if somebody is doing short term rentals in a 401k? Yes. UBIT, uh, short term rentals are a trader business and they will generate uh, UBIT. Unless it's passive? I think it's still going to generate. It's still a trader business. It's still trader business income. So UBIT is when you have unrelated business income and you're doing an activity inside of a retirement plan or any exempt entity. It's, it's mm-hmm. UBIT. It's, and they basically say, hey, you're in an active trader business. It's not fair not to tax you because you're competing with other businesses. I could see there being a couple of ways that you might be able to do that and get around, but it's definitely something you want to talk to somebody and dig into. You can generally get away with small amounts of things inside of a 401k. Like if you're flipping, we have like, hey, don't do more than five flips. Keep it like stagger them, do them very seldom. Or better yet, just borrow the money out of the 401k and do it in a corporation, (laughs) even better. But let's just say that you are doing some of this activity. Just make sure that it's the exception to the rule. And then make sure that you are not, you cannot be managing that. That has to be a third party or you're going to be dealing with some prohibitive transactions. So um, make sure that you're not doing it. And, and I th- think you really need to look at your strategy because you bet as tax on unrelated business income, not losses. Mm-hmm. So if you have a short-term rental that you're running at a loss or close to break even, uh, you Do could they... be holding that property for uh, um, growth. And I, I, I would probably be like most real estate. I know that there's people out there that do the 401ks and the IRAs because that's where their money is and that's what they're investing in real estate. I, I get it. But like short-term, you get such a huge tax benefit right now to have that in your personal realm. I would much prefer you guys have it in your personal realm. Oh, can I have one more thing? Mm-hmm. Don't do a cost segregation inside of an IRA or 401k. Not unless you're borrowing a ton of money in an IRA. Probably never. You shouldn't be doing that anyway. Hey, um, so my partner Clint came out with this really cool book. It is called, um, I'm not going to say what I, whenever I, I looked at this cover and I immediately said, oh, great, you 
you did a men's health book. I just, see if you guys figure that one out. But it's Next Level Real Estate Asset Protection by Clint. Uh, he just put it out. I don't think it's even available. I think it gets shipped uh, maybe now. I think, uh, let's see, it's number one Amazon new release in buying and selling homes. Fantastic. Clint does a really great job at breaking down the entities. Based on some of the questions I saw, you might want to be looking at it. It is available in Kindle and hardcover. And I'm just trying to remember when it, I think it just went live. So I think you could actually order it. Let's see what it says. Buy now, Wednesday, September 7th, or free delivery by September 9th. I think it's just coming out. So it might be something uh, I get mine Thursday. Oh, so it is available right now. Okay, so you can go get it right now. It's really one of those things. Like we write, all of us are goobers. We write books. So he says, I got a copy. And, uh, and, but Clint's really, really good on the asset protection side. We do events all the time. I tend to do the tax and Clint does the asset protection. He's really good at breaking down anonymity and with the difference between land trusts, corporations, uh, statutory trusts, all that good stuff. And uh, I don't see any reason why this would not be a great thing for anybody who's doing real estate to ask or to read. So it's always fun. So I'm going to get, I got my copy. Jeff, do you have a copy? I don't have my copy. I yet. might have an extra one for you in my room uh, or in my office. <laughs> I just like this because I can use it as a prop now. So I can point at Jeff. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm be like, he said it. And I can just. Put my what do you, you think, Jeff? Yes. So anyway, I just like that it has a funny arrow. And when I first saw it again, I was like, oh, you're writing a book on your experience with men's health. I'm glad you're, you're coming clean, Clint. Because um, my understanding is that he took the blue pill and all he did is get got taller. But that's just maybe. Da, da, da. Here we go. All right. More questions. It's uh, will you be giving Clint's book out for free at upcoming events? No, I don't think so. Um, but I am clueless on it. That's up to Clint. Um, somebody says, do you do cost segregation services? No, but we have a great resource that we could send you, Eric Oliver over at Cost Seg Authority, aba.link forward slash CSA. I know that's the link. Or, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I, sometimes I'm offensive. Bad Toby, bad Toby. All right. As an investor owner, is it possible? I can't help it. Look at this. I just looked at the cover and I was like, dude, like, uh, anyway, so I, 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 he's my partner. I have to make fun of him a little bit. As an investor owner, is it possible to claim part of, I'm, okay, uh, at least some people like it. All right, some people, all right. As an investor owner, is it possible to claim part of my internet, phone, and home office as expenses? This is the second it depends question. Uh, the internet and phone, uh, it's going to depend on what kind of entity you are. If you're an S or a C Corp, you can deduct them 100% if your employer requires you to have internet and phone. But if they're just an investor in real estate, they would still be able to write off a few things, would they not? Yes, you could write off the internet and phone, but only it's going to be limited to how much of it That's is used, used in for the them. business. See, what Jeff is talking about is if you have one of these beautiful little iPhones or whatever they are, which, oops, stop. I'm dialing my mother right now. <laughs> she called me and it just went right back. How do I hang up on my mom? Anyway, that's bad. Sorry, mom. Uh, but if you have one of these and your employer wants you to use it in your employment, I can reimburse 100%. So if, if I work for Jeff's CPA, and I use this, hey, I have to answer tax questions. Jeff could reimburse me 100%. I don't have to say what portion is personal or business. That's the benefit of an accountable plan. When you have a, when mm -hmm. you're an employee of an organization, to be an employee, by the way, that organization must be taxed, not has to be, but it must be taxed as S Corp, C Corp, so, uh, or a charity, 501c3. Most likely, if it's for profit, it's S or a C corp. So it could be an LLC taxes an S corp, LLC taxes a C corp. 
So I am going to reimburse 100% of that. If you are an investor, now I'm having to say, hey, I made 100 phone calls for 300 minutes. How many of those are related to your investment properties? And, oh, you made three of those 100 calls and it was you know, a portion of the time. I'm not going to get to write off much. That kind of stinks, right? I need to be able to write off the whole thing. You need to have the corporation in the mix. Yeah. And by the way, this explains that. Not to pimp Clint's book too much, but when you come to our event, the tax and asset protection event, we get into that. When you go and you spend time looking at the strategies that we've taught over the years and all the hundreds of hours of video on our YouTube, we explain that. Like we're breaking that down quite often. And I like what you just said. And I think it's even more applicable for like the home office. If you're running through a corporation who's managing your investments. 10 times better. Literally uh, 10 times the amount on, in, in several circumstances. Because you can write off, instead of just doing the $5 an hour or $5 a square foot mm -hmm. or the gross square footage, you can do net usable footage or you can do room methodology and you can do direct cost percentage uh, uh, excuse me, direct cost is 100% indirect cost. You can do portions. Like you could really get some benefit if you have a an administrative office in the home that you're being reimbursed for as opposed to a traditional home office. Uh, somebody, somebody says, what if you have a separate phone number for owner investor activities? Then you could break it down easier. If you have a separate phone or phone number that's only used 100% for business, then you can write that up. But then you have another phone for personal. Yeah. And I'd rather not track me. That's just me. I'd rather not deal with that. I'd rather just write it all off, which you can do if you're an employee of your S Corp or C Corp. Uh, somebody says, I bought the book, but I need to wait for the 6th of September. It's worth it. What are we, like the 30th today? 30th. Whew. And the 5th is Labor Day. 1031s are so stressful. Ah, James, start doing reverse 1031s where you acquire the property and then you sell. It might be a little bit less or find a good company that can, that, that has properties that you can just talk to and, and uh, maybe park it in, in investment properties until you find something that you really, really want. And then just make sure you're doing it that way. You might be doing a, 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 like a DST, Delaware statutory trust that's buying stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, my CPA did my S corp the last two years as a short-term rental passive, but now I realize I actually qualified as a trader business with that. Oh my gosh. Is that something that could be corrected? Yeah, Mike, absolutely. You got three years so we could fix it. Sorry. I'm reading chats. I'm not going to read chats anymore. I'm going to go like this. Can you explain the short-term rental tax benefit and how to get 100 hours of material participation? I don't even know where to start with this one. <laughs> what is, so we already talked about short-term rentals. Talked a lot. If there's seven days or less, it's a business. So just think pizza parlor. Jeff and me, we entered into a uh, an agreement. We're gonna we're gonna have an LLC that has a pizza shop, and we're gonna buy a pizza oven that's equipment. In a short term rental, we're in a business. We're in the pizza business, but our equipment is the portion of the property that's called twelve forty five property. So we have to determine what that is versus the structure. We can't write off the structure any faster than 39 years, but I can write off all of that, the linoleum on the floor, if you have hardwoods, the carpet, the countertops, all the specialty equipment. Like, hey, I had to plumb it. I had to put in electricity for this thing. I'm writing off a big chunk of that, about 30% of the value of that, of the improvement of the home itself, not the land, the improvement itself, I get to write off. If it's a trade or business, whether I get to write that off against my W-2 income or my other income depends on the type of income that it is and did I materially participate. So Jeff and I have a pizza parlor. Jeff works in the pizza parlor. I do not. I am just a, I'm just a silent owner. If there's losses, my loss is passive. I cannot use that passive loss against my W-2 income. Jeff is working in the business. He's what's called a material participant. He gets to use the loss against his other income. So when we look at a short-term rental, we now know it's trader business. 
if there and we if we create a loss by doing the cost seg and depreciating the pizza oven, you know the the, the short term components. Now the only question is, am I working in the business or am I silent partner? Working in the business means material participation. There are seven tests of material participation. The easiest is nobody else works in the business. It's just me. I don't even have to have an hour requirement. The test that you're looking at here is the second one, which is I did 100 hours and nobody else did more than me. Mm -hmm. So Jeff could qualify for this in our pizza oven. He could actually have done more than 100 hours in the, in the pizza business. And as long as nobody else did 100 hours, he gets to be the he, it's material participation. Really tough to do if it's a pizza shop, right? Or if it's a short-term rental. Somebody's going to probably be spending more time on it during a year. So then you get to the next one, which is 500 hours. If I work 500 hours in my short-term rental, it doesn't matter what anybody else does. It's I'm actively participating. I'm a material participant in that activity. I get to write off the losses against my W-2 and other income. That's the 10,000 foot view mm -hmm. of short-term rentals. Anything you wanna add? No, I just thinking about how do I get the hours? Um, it could be anything from directly working on the property it could be indirect collecting payments, uh, calling repair people. Uh, it could be keeping the books for the property, books and records for the property. You have to be managed. It has to be something involved with that property yep. and managing that property. So if, again, if you're doing Airbnb, you're running the red website, you're talking to people, you're doing this, that, and the other. So if you don't wanna worry about material participation, do everything yourself. You don't have to worry about it. That's why you saw that earlier question about the, the cleaning. Cleaning could be considered a substantial activity. Like if somebody cleans the, the unit and you're saying, hey, nobody else substantially participated in it, I did everything. The IRS would say, no, somebody else cleaned the unit. How many hours did they do? And then you're now, now you're down that path. Like, oh God, you know, do I have to figure this out? It might be five hours. But now it just pushed you into a situation where you have to do 100 hours and nobody did more than you. So now you and your spouse, by the way, it's not just you, right. you and a spouse, if you're married, have to add up to 100 hours. And it's not that difficult, really, if you're consistently doing Airbnb activities, you, you, could, you still treat them as one big activity if you have multiple. Um, but it just the question is always, can I get through that threshold? For our clients, I'll tell you, we usually we have W-2 clients, there are a lot of doctors, a lot of professionals. Mm -hmm. They don't wanna have to meet that 100 hours. They're just buying, usually they buy end of the year, usually October, November, December, they self-manage, get the big write-off and then turn it into a long-term rental. They're like, hey, I want the big deduction now and I'm, it's, it saves me so much money against my, income because I'm in the highest bracket. Every dollar I get to write off and put into this year is worth 50 cents to me. So I really want that deduction. And then I'll make it into a rental later or I'll let somebody else run it. And I don't care about the losses being uh, passive or, or active anymore. So that's basically it. Somebody says, oh, I won't get into that. I have to quit reading those so we can get out of here today. All right, if I offset all of the passive income with depreciation or accelerated depreciation, would that eliminate, eliminate the AMT adjustment? And this person's making less than $57,000 a year. Aren't they underneath the threshold? Oh yeah, the threshold for a single person is 73,000. For married, I think it's 114,000. Um, you, you know what used to be the biggest AMT adjustment was state and local taxes. Mm -hmm. And since they've been limited to $10,000, even that's virtually gone. There's still a couple left like- uh, you, don't, you don't use passive deduction against because it's, it's, it doesn't offset active income. Well, they could have different depreciation uh, methods, but for we're talking about short-term rental so much, mm -hmm. uh, the life we said was 39 years, for AMT it's 40 years. So mm -hmm. minute difference. 
Um, ISOs tend to have a big effect uh, in some stock options and tangible drilling costs. So it, it's not the normal thing that most people have. Here's the answer to this question. You don't have to worry about it. You're, be you're beneath the AMT threshold. You don't have to worry about it at all. For anybody above that, talk to your accountant because it's really complicated. Yeah. But your passive income would not really have an effect if it's truly passive income, mm -hmm. like rental real estate's not gonna have any effect. Uh, on your uh, 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 on your AMT equation. You're gonna either hit it or you're not. Uh, what has an effect, like Jeff just said, are things that adjust your ordinary active income downward, which means oil and gas, losses from business in which you materially participate. So trades or businesses, that's where the short-term rental could come in. Um, what other things could actually adjust the AGI? It wouldn't even be, um, 401k or contributions um, to retirement plans. Incentive right? stock options have a, ISO. have a big effect. So there you go. All right. Sorry, I'm going to, Toby's been pontificating too much today. I'm, I'm going to be in, put in timeout. Uh, I have a four unit I want to live in and rent out the other three units. What are the tax deductions and write-offs I can use to zero out earnings? Here's how I would handle this. I would bifurcate is it still bifurcated if you're cutting into four pieces? Anyway, uh, this into two properties. I'd have my personal residence in one of the units and the other 75% would be my rental properties. Mm -hmm. uh, any expenses related to my rental unit would go against my like real estate taxes and mortgage interest. My share of that would go against my 1040 uh, Schedule A. Uh, the other, any other expenses would be just like any other rental facility. You're, you're just looking at the total expenses on it, right? You're going to, I cannot depreciate my personal property. So if I live in one unit, mm -hmm. then, and assuming that they're all equal size, yeah, then you would get three quarters of the depreciation. You would get three quarters of the expenses that were incurred, like property taxes, you would get three quarters of things that were for the entire property, which I can't really think of any others that would really go other than the, the property taxes. Maybe the, maybe the loan, three, three quarters of the interest would be considered investment interest and not personal mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, and you would just treat it three, three quarters as an investment property, one quarter as a, uh, as a personal home. And then when you went to sell it, you would do the same thing. You'd say, all right, if I sold it and there was gain, I could literally 1031 exchange three of the four units, the profit on it. But that, and I could use a 121 exclusion, the, the, the 500,000 or $250,000 of capital gain exclusion on the sale of a home, whether you're married, yep. filing or, or single. And I could use that against that one unit of the, uh, of the, uh, of the four. Exactly what I was thinking. All right. Any details on the short-term rental loophole? I told you guys, they people had short-term on the brain this last week. Uh, any details on the short-term rental loophole in terms of how long you keep the rental in service for if you can do it for one year and then benefit from classification and then decide to use the property only for your personal use after that one year? If so, how much time does it need to stay in service or for how many rental days do you need to have a year? So I would say first off that if you start renting it in say 2023, it needs to stay a short-term rental for the entire year um, and do the cost segregation during that year mm -hmm. uh, to take advantage of the bonus depreciation. Um, and then you can turn it into that personal property in 2024. Yeah, technically there's no rule. Technically for every tax year. So let's say we looked at 2022. Mm -hmm they'd say, is this short-term, is this long-term, is this a residence? So the, let, let's go in reverse. Did you use it 14 days or 10% of the rented days? So let's say you rented it for 200 days. Did you use it for 20 days? If so, it's a residence and there's a portion of it that you're not gonna be able to take any deduction or loss against and there's a portion of it, you know, percentage wise, let's mm -hmm. say that you did 200 days and you had 20 days of business or personal use. So you'd have 90% of the 
uh, period of time was uh, investment, you'd be able to write off 90% of the improvement, the depreciation amount. So you have to break it into that piece. So you got to figure that out. Is it a residence or is it not? Then you look and say, is it long-term rental or is it short-term? And if it's short-term and with no residential use, like, hey, I didn't live in it, I didn't stay in it, then it's really clean. Can I now write that off? Even if I only put it in service in December, the IRS would look at that one period of time and say, how many days was it rented? How many unique rentals were there? In other words, were there, it was rented for 20 days and there were four different leases, you know, Airbnb mm -hmm. guests or bookings. You'd take the 20 divided by the four, that's five days, it's short-term rental. For that year, it qualifies as a short-term rental. Now we look at the following year and you ask the same questions again. Was it a residence? Was it an investment? If it was investment, was it short-term? Was it long-term? And it's a whole other period. So to answer your question, you could put it into service in December. You could accelerate the depreciation because it's a trader business. And we don't really care as long as you don't get rid of the property, it's not gonna have a tax impact to accelerate depreciation into that first year. As long as you're not disposing of the asset, if you turn it into a residence the following year, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't hurt you. So, oh, yeah, our, our concern is not how long you're holding it, but things you may be doing it during that same year that your short-term rental, Yeah. That, that's gonna ruin that short-term rental status. Yeah, well, you rent it for a long period of time or you stay in it too much. Yeah, then you're not going to be able to take that cost segregation. You're not going to be able to get the big deduction. And... That's always the issue. So people always say, like, we get this one. I think we got this one last time. Hey, I have a house. It's worth a lot. I'm going to make it into a short-term rental at the end of the year. This is why you can't do that because they say, was it, you know, how much of the time of the year was it? Was it residential? How much of it, mm -hmm. you know, were you staying in it or a member of your family or below market rents, those are the things that they look at. Uh, and, and if I had been living in it all year, so 300 days, I was living in it. All right, that's a residence, yeah. right? There might be a small portion of the depreciation that you could take, but it's not gonna be much. And you can't use any of that loss against your other income for that period of time if it's a residence. So that, that, that's where you get toast. Is there a video in the strategy where you buy properties at the end of the year? Yeah, look at my channel there you'll see it i think i think i just did one i think it's the cost seg is the number one tax strategy but there's definitely flowing around in there or you look at clint's uh youtube there's probably some on there too i know he's he talks about it but uh we both go into these concepts there's it's a small world that you end up in when you're in uh when you're in rental real estate you have, you see how we break it down. You're, you're thinking in little lists. Okay, is it residential? Do we have personal use? Is it a vacation home? Is it your residence? There's one that we never talked about, which is the 14 days or less where you just, you don't take depreciation, but you don't have to recognize any, any rents either. So if you take your personal home and you rent it out for 14 days, you can take all that income. You don't have to pay tax on it. You don't have to report it, but you don't depreciate the property either. It's still a residence. Right. So and then you look at it and say, okay, is it more than 14 days, more than 10% of the use, whichever one's greater? Um, yes. Then we only get a proportion of the deduction. No. Then we get the full deduction. And then the only question is, is it residential real estate or is it non-residential real estate? Is it short term? Uh, is it considered rental activity or not? And if it's not, then it's a trader business. If it is, then we lump it in with rental activities and other passive activity. Do you have any other passive activities that you're involved in that generate profit? If we have loss from this one, they offset or vice versa. If you have extra losses that are passive, then we go down the next checklist. Are you an active participant or are you a real estate professional? And we just start going through little lists in our head, seeing whether there's something that you could do to, to, to offset it. But that's really about it. Like I just gave you a kind of a broad view but that's 
that's literally kind of the whole world there on real estate. You're just going through and seeing which bucket you're going to fall in, which category, and then what are the rules for those? And yeah, you get pretty deep and you get nuanced on little, little issues, but you're looking at it for that 10,000 foot view. That's about what it is. So here's a great example. I bought a $400,000 home in 2021, and it's now ready uh, to use as a short-term rental, to use the short-term rental loophole. And everybody's really interested in that one, to offset some of my W-2 active income. I want to use a cost segregation study and claim bonus depreciation. So they just hit everything we just talked about. It's an active trader business because it's short-term rental. It's not, a, it's not rental, typical rental. They want to accelerate the depreciation on those items that could be removed from the, the home or removed from the property, which includes everything from your cabinets to, again, your carpet, to your linoleum, to your driveway, to your sidewalks, to trees you put out there, to the flowers you plant, to the fence that you put out there. All of that can be deducted under the last thing they said, bonus depreciation. I could write that whole thing off right now in one year. And then they go, should I use a do-it-yourself cost seg? And here, I'll make it really, like, I don't know your thoughts. Actually, I'll ask my, you My thoughts. thoughts are no, but I think you may have a different answer. No, I would say absolutely 100% not, because you're the do-it-yourself sounds like a good deal. It might be a lower price, but it's not the value. The value of having somebody do it, A, it's what you're supposed to do. It's what the audit guide requires as an audit, is, is an engineer. If you did it under a do-it-yourself, you're still going to pay, but you're going to get so much less of a deduction because they have to be so much more conservative. So in other words, if I had Eric Oliver and his team and his, and his engineers go out to a property, million-dollar property, subtract the land off it. Let's say it's $200,000 of land. There's 800000 A good company is going to get me between two hundred dollars and $240,000 of deduction. A do-it-yourself might get me 150. What's the cost to you of, of losing out on that extra 50 to $70,000 of deduction? Depends on your tax bill, but it's a much it's a, it's significantly higher than any savings you're getting on a do-it-yourself. Sometimes we fall into that. I'm just going to get the store brand because it's cheaper and it tastes the same. This it ain't it. Yeah, yeah. This uh, this this can have a make a huge difference on your deduction and. Yeah, it may sound expensive for what you're paying for it, but you're more than getting that back in your in your cost segregation. Yep. So if you're going to do something, focus on value. The way I used to say it, uh, because I used to make fun of H&R Block and some of the others, and no, no offense if you work for them. I just pointed out that when it came to business returns and investment returns, the government said they got 0% correct when they actually did the, the study on them. <laughs> And I thought that was really extraordinary. How do you get like none right? Like you think a broken clock is worth, we just write what, twice a day? Mm -hmm. They would have gotten one right, but they didn't. Um, so you might be able to go there and save 20% on tax prep. Because I went to H&R Block. Yes, I saved money. No, you didn't because they did it wrong and you missed out on $10,000 worth of tax benefit. So you saved 200 bucks. Let's say that it was $800 to get your returns done at H&R Block when you could have gone to an, a CPA firm or a good firm and paid a, a thousand. And somebody says, I saved 200 bucks, but it cost me 10,000. That's value versus price. And wealthy people focus on value. They want to know that it's done right. So I'll just tell you, I refer like we could be doing the cost seg studies. If I was going to do a do it yourself, they have solutions for CPA firms and, and, and lawyers to use to do the studies but it's not in your best interest. Yes, I could actually make money on it, but it's not in our client's best interest, so we don't do it. Uh, I'm an engineer that can do cost seg for others. Do you still recommend a third party? Jeffrey, I would talk to cost seg authority. Absolutely. Even, even you, you, you could probably do your own, but it's kind of the, the, the doctor working on themselves or the lawyer representing themselves. They say the lawyer that represents himself has a fool for a client, right? It's because you're going to have blinders on. Again, it's up to you, but I would actually talk to uh, like cost seg authority. Maybe you could do uh, analysis for them, or maybe they could work with you because you're a professional and say, hey, 
you know, here, it's going to take us a lot less time if you do all this work, but if you do this, we'll assist you. Just, just have that discussion. But as a matter of course, don't do things yourself. Everybody that always does that, there's a learning curve and there's always a price to be paid. I would rather you not pay that price. I'd rather you get the benefit. And Class Ag Authority will tell you whether the benefit's worth it because they will do an analysis before they charge you to tell you what they think it will, be, it will get. Uh, how about Class Ag? Can we use it for long-term? Yeah. I don't know what that means. Long-term rentals, but yes. Yeah, you absolutely can. You're breaking it down. And you're, again, you have that study. So I look at the IRS audit guide and it wants a professional study of somebody who went into the property. There's an exception if you have the same property, same build, like it's uh, the same home or the same units in, a, in an apartment complex or something along those lines. But for single families, you, have, you do them for each one. You don't mess around. It's not worth it. The money saved versus actually being physically in there and getting the nuances and getting every dollar as a deduction the amount that you leave behind is, is, is much more than the extra cost that it would have cost to do it right. Um, hey, there's there, uh, my YouTube channel. If you haven't heard about it enough, there it is again. I'm staring at you. Uh, you can go in there and subscribe. Um, we like subscribers to it, and there's lots and lots of playlists. Some of you guys said, where do I find out more information about the short-term strategy, things like that? Go in there and coast around my channel. You will find it. Um, and then last thing, Ask your questions. We answered, I'm looking at 275 questions. Oh, we okay. had, yeah, we had we had a really good group on. So we had 275 questions. Um, and you could ask Tax Tuesday at Anderson Advisors during the next two weeks between, between our Tax Tuesdays. And we still answer your questions. Why do we do this, Jeff? Are we just nuts because we like answering tax questions for nothing? We like educating people. Yeah. And a smart client is a better client. Smart clients are the best clients. Somebody says cost segs on new builds still need a cost seg engineer. Not necessarily, like you still want to have somebody that understands it, but if you have the, if you ever broke it down, the components and what you cost, then you can do it. Absolutely. Um, all right. Now I don't, I, I don't sell cost seg guys. I, I'll just send you someplace else. Uh, but yeah, Jeffrey, if you reach out, we'll, we'll send you the, the, the team that does it. We, we work with a firm, a CPA firm that all they do is energy credits and cost segregation. Energy credits are going to be huge next year. The 45 L if you're doing rehabs, if you're building properties, you want to be aware of this. It's up to a $5,000 tax credit per unit. So if you do apartments, you want to be aware of these things to see if you can get the tax credit, not a deduction. It's a credit. And they just extended not only the, the 2000, but they enhanced it and made it easier. Um, somebody says, doing my cost seg walkthroughs this week. Yes, and you can do cost segs even for 2021 still. You can do them even if you sold the property. You'd be shocked how much you might actually get put back in your pocket when you do it. Uh, anyway, so reach out to us at Tax Tuesday at andersonadvisors.com. Visit us on our website, sign up for our courses. Uh, we teach them every other week and, uh, and we love going out and educating it. Anything else, sir? No, sir. Very active group today. You guys get a star. I know we were heavy on the short-term uh, rentals. I, I get that. Do we have some questions on those? Yeah, we had a couple questions on short-term rentals. We have days where we have none and then we just got <laughs> So at least you guys are thinking which is awesome. And uh, that was awesome. So appreciate you guys. We will see you in two weeks. Until then, this is Toby and Jeff at Tax Tuesday. Thanks, guys.